the Surrealists, the city was a place of chance encounters. If you wandered it aimlessly, what you would be revealing is a kind of collage of competing elements. Surrealism's first and major base was Paris. Paris in the 1920s, an extraordinary post-war, multicultural city, many emigres. It was a relatively small city, extremely walkable. You could wander aimlessly through it, letting your rationality slip away and enjoying all the contingencies that the city had to offer. And not only that, but the city was full of desires especially for the surrealists who were always on the lookout for sexual encounters. And there were many opportunities for sexual dalliances of one sort or another. Richard Wentworth is known for many things, for constructing rather extraordinary little sculptural objects out of not very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> But he's also very much known for his wanderings of the city and the photographs that he takes in the city. I mean, the thing about London is that you're always looking at power. And this is just the most beautiful graph of imagery. So you see... We're going to see two very different kinds of city views. The first, up here on the roof of this car park in Peckham, where we can see the city laid out before us, an idea of its structure and its order. Mm. And the old hierarchies of the church, too. We can see St Paul's, which is now dwarfed by all the business towers, of course. Yes, if you, if you put your spectacles on, you can see St Paul's. <laughs> And then by contrast, we're going to go down into the streets of Peckham, how the Surrealists would see its, its promiscuity, its productive chaos. There's a certain parallel between what interests the Surrealists about the city and what interests Wentworth about the city, particularly the idea that people make of it what they will. There are all sorts of unofficial uses of the city, both in terms of the ways in which one might wander around it, but also the things that are done within it. Imagine being asked to uh, write a document on this piece of ground. I mean, there's a, a kind of dressing room with coat hangers on rails and then some rails without coat hangers. I mean, that's a, mm. that's a surrealist compound um, down there. I'm nourished by it. I mean, I'm very, you know, there's, there's two uh, extractors fitted to this wall, very, competent pieces of sheet metal work and one is smaller than the other and that's like the whole of the history of sculpture is in there you know is the little one a maquette for the big one what, why is there a small one and a big one why are they the same there are some lights or I would call them lights there are these discs very carefully mounted as if it was some sort of uh, Venice Biennale art installation on green posts down there. And then I notice that the poor discs look exactly the same as what I would guess was a domestic stool. And of course the stool is next to a little broom and the broom is next to a little pipe. Though, and that is, that is a perfect little moment that I could be up here with various dead serialists and they would go, Mon Dieu, c'est incroyable! Or, caramba, chaos. A talented enough surrealist eye could see something of interest almost wherever you are in the city. But I think it's true that there are certain areas of the city which interest the surrealists more than others, which seem to be fuller of contingency. I mean, that's nearly 100 years of architecture, with everything being applique. So you're in, in the land of the palimpsests. You know, there are so many things. And the eye just zooms across it because it's too exhausting to take it to pieces. But you know, the, the, the modernist glazing bars are setting up shadows that no one would ever have expected because there's a curtain that's been abandoned inside. There's even a little vent at the top yes. here in what looks to me like it's hanging in a broken window. So it's venting a vented space. You know, what, were we here with, with any of the Surrealists, they'd get it, but they would actually be, I think they'd be assaulted 
I think there were a number of things they would have been, you know, surprised by. I mean, one would be the extent to which traffic has suppressed social life in the streets, so that there's, I and mean, there are people walking about, and you, it's just about possible to have a conversation and so on. But you really have to watch yourself the whole time. You're not going to get just just run down. And then the, the the sheer weight and variety of commercial culture. I mean, if you look at Paris photographs of that time, sure, there's quite a bit of advertising, but nothing like this. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a bit about the, um, the pace of the Flaneur, this aimless wanderer through the city. And Gerard de Nerval, I think it was, who took his tortoise out for a walk in order to you know, regulate his pace and to really slow himself down so he could see everything. The great fear on this, the pavement now is just standing in poo. Um, and Oldenburg writes about uh, dog poo rising like cathedrals from the, the pavement. Great. Um, I don't know whether he was referring to um, Gaudi, but I've never seen a Gaudi in the same way since. <laughs> I'm in the pavement. The, the street is a public place, and the pavement is part of that public place. But the pavement is, as a general rule, understood to be for us to process along. Mm. But then there are interruptions, and there are intentional interruptions and less intentional interruptions. Canal Street in New York in the 70s was very much like this. So mm. these are the discs that you put underneath wedding cakes. So this is a kind of catafalque or cenotaph to marriage or weddings. Um, and it, obviously, the, people, people get married they have cakes, there's going to be a cake-based industry, but it's not often that you're actually confronted by it. And it is a sculptural object, and the, the way it blocks the pavement reminds me a bit of that Reinhardt remark about sculpture being something that you back into when yeah. you're looking at painting. Yeah. yeah. Oh! Wow. And there's more. You want to move? Oh, you want to come here? Okay. Many of the juxtapositions that the Surrealists cultivated as they walked around the city seem very familiar to us now. We see surreal juxtapositions in advertising, for instance, pretty insistently. We see them a lot in the gallery where very mundane and ordinary objects are brought in, altered a little bit and then displayed for us as, you know, elements of high art. And Do you think there's a way in which this um, in a way of attending to the street, which is partly surrealist and partly older, it goes back to you know, the romantic poets and so on. But it's become very much saturated throughout the culture. And it's maybe partly to do with the fact that you know you so often go to galleries and you see things rearranged, you know, mundane objects rearranged, which only very slightly in order to become yeah. artworks. Um, and, well, and so it's not hard to imagine that this unstable object <laughs> could be I, well, I think similarly it, arranged. I think it's a very, uh, I'm very anxious about it and I think I try and pre be productive in a way which I don't really need to criticise it. There's a way that the surreal sensibility has become highly familiar to us and in a sense domesticated. This is why we look back at surrealist art, we often feel a kind of weary familiarity with it. Actually what I see in streets like this is um, survival. And I think what's very funny is the way that they, how they migrate across time. So number seven is in some conversation with a, a modest popular idea of modernism and the door has been pushed out to the outer surface. Number nine has a, was given originally a very modest space, which could be called a porch. So nine is self-consciously talking to the past. Somebody thinks they are. And number seven is, was talking to the future. I have an idea that if the Surrealists were on this street, what they would like is they would like to penetrate the facades. The city at 
the time for the Surrealists was a fantastically complex, chaotic, contingent place. So our experience of wandering the city is very different from that of the Surrealists. Remember that their city, despite its marginal freedoms, was still a place which was very hierarchical, very religious, and quite heavily policed. Those old hierarchies of deportment and religion and prudence, you know, all those old virtues uh, have fallen away. Um, and that is a liberation.